Hello! Welcome to an adventure. <laughs> Today on Archival Adventures, we will continue and finalize our exploration of uh, questionable medicines, I guess? It's uh, folk medicines, home remedies, and patent medicines um, here on Archival Adventures, uh, live on both twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27. I gesture these directions because that's the computer that has the one and that's the computer that has the other. So <laughs> I can see both chats. Anyway, before we begin, just a couple of acknowledgements that I do at the top of every show. Um, I want to acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the cus traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. I want to pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation, and at any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge uh, that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to that legacy. Further, I want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was also previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So, thank you for that. Welcome Lord Portico, Le welcome Key Squared, uh, welcome anybody who hasn't commented in chat. Uh, it's always great to have some um, viewers. <laughs> Whether you're chatting or lurking, you are appreciated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Fluid Ann. Uh, we had um, the caption ghost showed up today. Uh, the pre stream before I go live captions talking to the audience, apparently. Um, <laughs> and I apparently the caption ghost is named DeCab. Um, anyway, <laughs> hopefully, you're having a great week. Um, it's been um, one week since we did the show, uh, and in one week, we will not be doing a show. Um, I can't build a community and be live on this platform without acknowledging some of the stuff that has gone on recently um, on Twitch. Um, I'm a tiny, tiny streamer. Uh, both of the channels that my content goes out on, whether it be the library's channel or my personal channel, are tiny. Um, and so I haven't suffered any of the targeted hate raids. I have been followed by many of the bot accounts that um, have been triggering those, and I've been doing my best to keep them uh, under wraps and at bay. Um, and I know that the, the mods and administrators of the Libraries channel have been doing the same, trying to preemptively block and ban uh, all of these bots because the platform itself, Twitch, has not implemented any sort of protections against the truly reprehensible conduct that has been perpetrated, honestly, probably by a really small number of people. Um, who are using scripting and creating lots of bot accounts to go and attack marginalized streamers. Uh, so there is an effort to do what uh, is being called a day off Twitch next Wednesday, September 1st, uh, to kind of demonstrate to Twitch that this that the streamers who care about this and are impacted by it um, uh, I guess, to get them to actually notice, <laughs> which, I mean, they've acknowledged that it's a problem. In fact, the Twitch uh, account itself was targeted uh, with one of the bot hate raids yesterday, I believe. Um, so it's out there, but there is this coordinated effort to kind of draw attention to the issue and um, kind of take a stand and show that we support 
the marginalized streamers who've been targeted, etc. So next Wednesday, I will not be live for this show on either channel. Um, I will be taking up taking part in the A Day Off Twitch um, because so much of the work that I do as an archivist is focused on um, historically marginalized communities. And so something that is to show solidarity with marginalized communities uh, on a platform that I use regularly to share content is something that I feel uh, very much that I should be taking part in. So this show will be dark next week, um, but we will return in two weeks on this channel uh, for the Gerhard Mansbach Technical Manuals Collection, which uh, should be relatively interesting. It's a lot of early computer manuals, um, which in itself is kind of neat, but it is as yet an unprocessed collection. So you will get to see um, kind of what materials look like before we've gone through and cleaned them up and organized them. Um, it's not one of the messier ones. so. Uh, it's something that I feel like I can actually tackle um, sharing a, an unprocessed collection. But so that will be in two weeks on September 8th that we will be doing that. But today, today is our last week doing um, folk medicine, home remedies, and uh, patent medicines. So I'm going to switch over to the document view so that you can see what the document cam is looking at. Um, and absolutely comment in chat if you've got questions, observations about the things that we're looking at. Oftentimes the stuff that I'm looking at on here is the first time I've seen it. Uh, and you often know more about what I'm looking at than I do. So I'm always happy to get um, the commentary from chat. Um, and hi, Hannah. <laughs> so the first one that I wanted to share today is uh, Reed and Karnick Diets for the Seat. <laughs> Diets for the Seat. Diets for the Sick, um, which is an item from our Rare Books collection. And it's the one that I used for the image for uh, the tweet announcing today's episode. So I thought it would be a good one to start with. It's a little flip book. Um, hmm. I've got just a little bit of glare from the lights. Let me see if I put it at an angle. <laughs> Live programming. Rolling over the cord for the headphones is uh, not a great thing to do. I don't think that angle is really helping, do you? <laughs> um, it probably is just a tad out of focus. Let me hit the autofocus. Well, it's just the cover that's glossy, so hopefully once we get inside the item, it'll be better. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know, Hannah. I probably would have forgotten to hit the autofocus. But as you can see, there's a picture of a nurse on the cover here, uh, holding a tray with some cups, etc. cetera. Um, and it's called Diets for the Sick. It has some extremely small print down at the bottom. I'm gonna pick it up and bring it close to my eyes to see if I can tell what that says. Patent, June 6, 1905, the Whiteshead and Hogue Company, Newark, New Jersey. But that is like a one-point font. It is tiny and extremely hard to read, even in person. So on screen, there's no way. <laughs> um, but what we have here, oh, I, I don't know which side is the front. I guess this is the front. So the, the picture is on the back, apparently. Um, 
Complements of Reed and Karnick, Manufacturing Chemists, Office and Laboratories, Numbers 42, 44, 46, Germania Avenue, Jersey City, New Jersey. And inside, um, as you can see, the very first page has actually been torn out of this um, because I believe each of the pages in here are actually perforated. Um, so I don't think the front page was perforated, which is why it's torn. Um, and I don't know what was on the front page. But as you can see, there's an index on the front here. And the listings are biliousness, Bright's disease, cholera and phantom, constipation, debility, diabetes, diarrhea, dyspepsia, fact, fevers, gout, infants, liver trouble, malnutrition, uh, neurasthenia, obesity, phthisis, poisons and antidotes, pregnancy, price list, respiration at various ages, rheumatism, and summer diarrhea of children. Um, Oh, there's a forward. Let me read this forward and see if I, because I don't, I don't want to like force it open. I want to, so trying my best to show it to you. The importance of the diet is certain. Nope. I was trying to read it from the monitor that's behind the camera. It's too small. I can't. Um, the importance of the diet in certain diseases is such that we are sure that the physicians value this little book. In this 12th edition, we have carefully revised the diets to the present date. As in many diseases, it is not advisable for the patient to know why such diet is ordered. Consequently, we have designated the leaflet, which is to be torn off by the Roman number, and you can always refer to them by consulting the index. We would also ask you to read carefully the blue pages. They might prove of value at some time. Questions may arise from time to time, which, uh, which some of the hospital trained physicians on our staff will be pleased to answer. When you have used up this book, we shall be glad to furnish another upon request. It is not advisable for the patient to know why such diet is ordered? <laughs> We're going to put you on a special diet, but we're not going to tell you why. Um, I don't think that would go over too well today. <laughs> but this was turn of, turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. So I don't know. And then we've got brights and other forms of nephritis. Last month you had a product placement count. That is true. Are you asking if if we've continued counting? Because I have not kept track. You should have had a shady nonsense counter this month. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in acute nephritis, only milk should be allowed. But in the chronic diseases of the kidney, a more varied diet is used. On account of the faulty elimination of nitrogen, nitrogenous products, it was formerly considered advisable to omit as far as possible proteids, but with the coming of the new treatment, it est the giving of nephritin, it is found that a larger amount of nitrogenous foods can be given and the diet steadily increased while giving nephritin or nephritin. Okay, somebody, somebody tell me what nephritis is? So I know a nephrologist deals with blood pressure. So would nephritis be, itis usually refers to an infection or inflammation. I don't know, inflammation of the blood? That doesn't seem right. Somebody look up what nephritis is for me and let me know in chat. A word about nephritin or nef nephritin may be advisable at this time. Nephritin is the grains of segregation. 
and other nucleo en enzymes of the cells of the what nephritin is the quote grains of segregation unquote and also nucleo enzymes of the cells of the cortex and convoluted tubules of the kidney remember it is not a dried or desiccated kidney but a true product kidney inflammation or infection thank you key squared <laughs> i did not understand a word of this paragraph or of this sentence the grains of segregation and other nucleo enzymes uh, enzymes of the cells of the cortex and convoluted tubules of the kidney it is not a dried or desiccated kidney it is a true product okay it has been found that 10 tablets given in divided doses daily is the usual dose, but individual cases may require different amounts. This can be determined by the change in the urine. Examine the urine carefully before beginning treatment and then give 10 tablets in divided doses daily, and they are best given between meals and at bedtime. Examine the urine again on the third day, and if the urea index has not markedly increased, the dose must be increased, although not enough to irritate the kidney. On the fifth day, there should be a decided increase in the specific gravity and also of something. I can't turn the page. The solids eliminated. Following this is seen the disappearance of casts and other patholo pathological elements from the sediment. The albumin is usually the last to disappear, and this, except in acute cases, diminishes slowly. There are a certain class of cases of nephritis which do not improve on nephritin and are distinguished by an arteriocapillary fibrosis, uh, but in 85% of the acute cases and 63% of the chronic, marked improvement has been obtained by the use of nephritin. So marked indeed has this been that every case should at least be put on the treatment for two or three weeks trial, watching the urine carefully. Diet, as we said before, can be gradually increased, but food should be made as digestible as possible in order not to put the... Uh, in order not to put too great a strain upon the kidney. To help the digestive apparatus, nothing can equal peptenzyme, a full description of which will be found under dyspepsia. It is given in tablet, powder, or elixir forms, two to four tablets, 10 to 20 grains of powder, or two to four teaspoonfuls of elixir are given half the dose before meals and half after meals. Memoranda. <clears throat> I don't know why that was so difficult for me to read, but, uh, ooh. and then we get into a diet for it. Brights and other forms of nephritis may take soups, light broths with barley or rice, fish and vegetable soups, meats, fat meats, bacon, chicken, game, meats to be used sparingly, bread and farinaceous articles. Stale bread, hominy, wheat and grits, rice, toast, oatmeal, gruels, vegetables, spinach, summer cabbage, turnip tops, watercresses, lettuce, mushrooms, celery, green vegetables, generally. Uh, desserts, rice and milk puddings, fruits, which are not very acid unless there is digestive disturbance, and all laxative fruits. I love that they actually included a desserts section in their their list of recommended diet. Uh, drinks, water abundantly, hot water, milk, skimmed milk, buttermilk, lacto preparata, soluble food, and weak tea. If there is much digestive disturbance and if mastication is not perfectly performed, the meats may be scraped or finely chopped made into balls and lightly browned or boiled. In some instances, experience will indicate a radical change and a milk or vegetable diet will best answer. The list, however, as given, is that which is generally agreed upon. 
Avoid highly seasoned soups, fried fish, pork, corned beef, veal, hashes, stews, heavy bread, batter cakes, potatoes, gravies, lamb, peas, beans, all made dishes, puddings, except, so wait, you're just supposed to eat raw foods, not, nothing that's been made into a dish? Interesting. Uh, puddings, except as allowed above, pies, cakes, ice cream, all saccharin dishes and starch foods, except as allowed, all spices and highly seasoned dishes, alcoholic drinks, malt liquors, coffee, and tobacco. Whew. Uh, let me see. There were some interesting things in the index. Facts. I need to go to page 65 because they have a page just labeled facts, and I need to know what they think are facts. Um, I Did it say no coffee? Yeah, no coffee. Avoid coffee. <laughs> Will not be on this diet. Yeah. Facts. Let me, let me see. I don't think I need the angle. But if I do that, it's really small for you all, isn't it? Let me zoom in a little. Instead of giving you a glorious view of my hands, you'll still get to see my hands because this is a tiny thing that wants to close on itself and so my hands are necessary to keep it open. Uh, but that's a bit better. Okay, fat. Medicines administered by the rectum or vagina should be given in twice the dose by the mouth. Medicines administered by the hypodermic method should be given in one half the dose by the mouth. Be cautious in giving atropia to flaxen-haired, light-complexioned, nervous women. What? Be cautious in the use of morphia subcutaneously after opiates or morphia have been given by the mouth or rectum. The healthy mucous membrane of the bladder never absorbs medicine. An ulcerated vesicle mucous membrane does. Chloral hydrate should be exhibited with great care to determine the uh, proportionate dose of a drug for a child or infant Divide dose for adult by age of child over age of child plus 12. Eye washes of nitrate of silver, if long used, discolor the eye. Eye washes containing lead are apt to leave a permanent opacity where there is any ulceration. Children are especially susceptible to the narcotic action of opium and its alkaloids. A catheter should never be forced into the bladder. All catheters should be kept perfectly clean. After each, after each using, they should be dipped in carbo, carbolized oil, washed in warm water, and if gum elastic, be put away in zinc powder, powdered soapstone, or starch. All soft rubber articles are rendered hard and brittle by contact with oil or grease. Catheters used in... Uh, poor peril cases should be rendered thoroughly, er, thoroughly aseptic. Never attempt to reduce a hernia by force. <sighs> Some of these probably are still useful facts, but at the moment they all just seem rather suspect to me. I feel like I'm reading a guide for the for the uh, uh, I forget what it was called there, but for the place in um, The Color of Water. Is it The Color of Water? I think that's what I want. Movie. It was a movie with a convalescent home or something. Uh, no, Shape of Water. Shape of Water? Yes, that's the one I mean, the shape of water. Um, <laughs> the road to Wellville would also be a good choice for that, but I was thinking of the shape of water. Um, 
All right, I'm just gonna pick another one here. See what their recommended course of treatment is. Oh, key squared. That was a good guess. And uh, let's see. Let's look at uh, phthisis, page 53. One that, of course, now that I'm picking it, I realize is a very bad choice since I can barely say the word. Uh, phthisis. Phthisis? Anyway, this thing, P-H-T-H-I-S-I-S, -I -I phthisis. In tuberculosis, there is a distinct tendency toward spontaneous cure, which is related to a state of general nutrition and vigor of the vital process. Uh, that was a quote from Boviard. The vital processes have been shown to be best strengthened by the following prescription. Protonuclein beta, five gram cubes, number 60. Uh, SIG? I don't know what that's an abbreviation for. Uh, signals, maybe? Uh, two cubes, three times a day. Protonuclein beta consists, consists of protonuclein with an equal amount of the nucleoplasm and protoplasm of the spleen. Absolute and definite results have been obtained and are being obtained daily by this method of treatment, not only in the early stages, but in some very advanced cases, as will be seen by reading this leaflet carefully. In this connection, it is interesting to note that beginning in France and spreading throughout Europe and America, and interest, and interest has been aroused in the treatment of tuberculosis by the use of certain animal extracts, particularly that secured from the spleen. It is said, and we have as our authority, the interesting and quite extensive writings of, of Professor Bale of Cannes, France, uh, that splenic extract increases the weight and nutrition in a remarkable degree and therefore is claimed to be a most valuable adjunct remedy in the treatment of tuberculosis. In one of the doctor's communications, Revue de, Me de Médecine, uh, Paris, June 10th, 1911, he refers to 146 out of 150 cases which have shown, quote, the unquestionable rapid effects of this treatment, unquote. Quote, out of the numerous cases of hip, joint, and bone tuberculosis, and also the case of cases of scrofula glands in the neck, there has been a single there has not been a single case reported in which marked results have not been obtained by the use of protonuclein beta. In cases of phthisis, uh, even where it was used as the last resort, results already obtained. Uh, show that protonuclein beta should be used as an adjunct in every case of tuberculosis that comes into the hands of the physician and benefit more or less marked will be noted in over 80% of the cases. Trophonine should be given iced or in an equal amount of wine or milk, the dose depending somewhat upon the emaciation of the patient a tablespoonful being the maximum dose, and it should be taken three or more times a day. From the results we have personally seen, as well as from the results sent to us, we are of the opinion that every case of phthisis should take protonuclein beta and uh, trophonine as part of their treatment, as well as that they should have plenty of fresh air and proper food. We know that you will not be disappointed if you use these two products. Um, <laughs> Lord Portico, I think there's quite a lot of product placement in this book as well. Tysis. I'm just going with Tysis. May take soups, etc., beef tea, mutton, and chicken broth, clam soup, turtle soup, all rich soups which may be found to agree with the stomach. Eggs may be given in broth. Fish, trout, fresh fish if it agrees, raw oysters, raw clams. 
meats, etc. Bear or beef rare, scraped meat, bacon, mutton roasted, roasted or boiled poultry, game eggs beaten raw with whiskey and sugar, soft boiled eggs, mutton fat, beef fat, ham fat, salad oil, and sweetbreads. Bread and farinaceous articles. Wheat bread, Indian bread, rice, used sparingly. Vegetables and fruits, spinach, asparagus, lettuce, cresses, celery, tomatoes, greens, green peas, used vegetables sparingly, fruits if they agree, baked potatoes. There's no dessert section on this one. Uh, drinks, water, hot water, half a pint, 30 minutes before meals, uh, brandy, whiskey, milk, milk punch, wines, malt liquors, malt preparations, and cream. Note, for patients under 30, food should be highly hydrocarbonaceous. For those over, albuminous. Some simple foods should be taken between meals and on going to bed, such as a glass of milk or cream or a milk punch. A cup of hot soluble food just before retiring will induce sound and refreshing sleep. Avoid starches and farinaceous foods as a rule. Potatoes, turnips, carrots, all pies and pastries, fried and made dishes, sweets, gravies, puddings, and sweet wines. <laughs> it's interesting. So each of these little, um, like the page that we just read that tells you uh, the diet to be eaten, um, it's a perforated thing that you tear out and give to the patient. And it does not include the name of what they're being treated for. It just tells them what diet they should eat. Also not on that diet. Yeah, no pie, no sweet wines, no puddings, no, no sweets. Yeah, no, that diet's not gonna work for me. <laughs> Read incarnate diets for the sick from roughly 1900-ish, clearly after 1911, because they referenced something from 1911. Um, next I have S.J. Sears, Dr. Sears' domestic, domestic receipt book from 1868. This one is in not the greatest of condition. I think I am going to get out the little... Uh, foam here and we'll set up so that it should hopefully center there we'll show it to you let me take it out of the um, plastic Dr. S.J. Sears domestic receipt book 1868, published by Dr. Samuel J. Sears, Tuthill, Ulster County, New York. So let us see what is inside here. Published, yeah, so same information as on the cover. Dr. S.J. Sears' Compound Expectorating Cough Syrup for the complete cure of coughs, colds, influenza, croup, asthma, whooping cough, and all the diseases of the lungs, including, er, uh, sorry, tending to consumption. Testimonial. Shawanook, Ulster County, New York, 1868. Dr. S.J. Sears, sir, I assure you I have good cause to estimate your cough syrup very highly, uh, having derived great benefit from its use for some time past. Uh, for some time past, I had a trouble and... Oh, sorry. Wow, why is this so hard for me to read? For some time past, I had a troublesome cough together with pain in the breast and night sweats, which I feared might end in some serious pulmonary complaint. Indeed, some of my neighbors were sure I had the consumption. Being prevailed upon to try your cough syrup, 
I used several bottles, and I'm glad to be able to say I am perfectly well and that I attribute my recovery solely to your valuable medicine. Thomas... McElhone? It's a little difficult to make out the last name. It's definitely uh, MC E L H O N. I think it's an E, but I'm just going to say it's McElhonk because why not? <laughs> because uh, that sounds fun. Um, I'm sure it's McElhoney or something like that, but it kind of looks like a K on the end, so McElhonk it is. Uh, breakfast and tea cakes. <laughs> breakfast rolls. One cup sweet milk, whites of two eggs, two thirds cup butter, flour to make a thick batter, one half a cup of yeast, two tablespoons sugar, raise overnight and add eggs and butter in the morning. So we're getting, it's, it's a receipt book. So recipes, um, in this case, recipes for food and not medicines. Uh, we have Union buckwheat cakes, premium cornbread, Lincoln cake, and gold cake. Lincoln cake being two eggs, two cups of sugar, a half cup of butter, one of sweet milk, three of flour, one teaspoonful of cream tartar, half a teaspoonful of soda, and one of lemon essence. And it's up to you to figure out what to do with all that, in what order to combine the ingredients, and how long to cook them for, and at what temperature. Because it's an old recipe. It's just a list of ingredients. That's excellent sponge cake, excellent common cake, nut cake, fruit cake. Okay, just because fruit cake is so heavily maligned, I'm gonna read the fruit cake recipe. Two and a half cups dried apples, stewed until soft, add one cup of sugar, stew a while longer, and chop the mixture to which add one half cup of cold coffee, one of sugar, two eggs, a half cup of butter, one nutmeg, one teaspoonful of soda, and cinnamon and spices to taste. That's an apple spice cake. Not what we think of as fruit cake today that has like preserved fruits in it. That is an apple spice cake. Uh, delicate cake, ice cream, cornstarch cake, light cake, tea cake, excellent sponge cake, cupcake. 1868, we have a recipe for cupcakes. Five eggs, three cups of sugar, one of butter, one of milk, four of flour, one teaspoonful of... Saleratus? I don't know that ingredient. Saleratus. Sodium bicarbonate, or sometimes potassium bicarbonate, as the main ingredient of baking powder. See, what else do we have? Continues with pies and puddings. And then, okay, so we have pies and puddings, lemon pies, cream pie, green apple pie, cornstarch pie, lemon pie, uh, cornmeal pudding, cottage pudding, boiled batter pudding, Indian meal pudding, Rusk? I do not know what rusk is, so I'm going to read that recipe. Three cups of sugar, three cups of new milk, and one cup of butter. Heat your butter, milk, and sugar to er, heat your butter, milk, and sugar together. Pour them out into a pan, thicken in flour enough to make a stiff batter. Add two eggs well beaten, two large teaspoonfuls of yeast, and let it rise. Then make it out in pans and let it stand until ready to bake. I still don't really know what it is. 
It sounds like some sort of cake or sweet bread of some sort. Um, but then we get into some uh, non-food items like horse liniment. And a very interesting one, second to last here, cure for a felon. Biscotti. That would make sense, key squared. That that with those ingredients and the preparation described, biscotti would make a lot of sense. Cure for a felon. Soak the finger in salt and water as hot as you can bear it until the inflammation is reduced. Then apply a plaster of turpentine and salt. This will effect a speedy cure. I don't understand. What is the word felon being used to mean in that sentence or in, in that context? What is the definition of a felon in 1868? Ah. Okay, so Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, definition number three, a painful abscess of the deep tissues of the palmar surface of the fingertip that is typically caused by bacterial infection, as with a staphylococcus, and is marked by swelling and pain. So not a cure for someone who has committed a crime, but rather for a painful abscess on your finger. Soak it in salt and water, which will just soften up the skin uh, and reduce the inflammation. And then a plaster of turpentine and salt, which seems questionable. A lot of old remedies used turpentine and they all seem questionable. But that's how you cure a felon, apparently. Another. This one is simply called another. I wonder if it means another cure for a felon? Take the lining out of the shell of an egg, wrap it around the finger, let it remain as long as you can bear it, then take it off and apply another. This is a certain cure if applied in time. Okay, so the lining... The, the inner lining of an eggshell wrapped around the finger where it is. And because it's a painful abscess, you leave it on as long as you possibly can bear it. That one seems more simple than the um, turpentine and salt. Cure for diarrhea. On one half, or sorry, one half ounce of laudanum, one half ounce spirits nitre, 40 drops oil of peppermint, one half pint of good brandy. This is honestly the first recipe that we've seen that included laudanum. Uh, for those who don't know, and I'm, I want to get an actual definition because I'm familiar with it from like works of fiction. Um, laudanum. An alcoholic solution containing morphine prepared from opium and formerly used as a narcotic painkiller. And then, so this has laudanum and nitre. Which is potassium nitrate. Uh... So laudanum and spirits of nitre with peppermint oil and brandy to cure that diarrhea. And then yet another remedy for a felon. This one is titled A Sure Remedy for a Felon. Take a pint of common soft soap and stir in air slackened lime till it is of the consistency of a glazer's putty. Make a leather thimble, fill it with this comp composition, and insert the finger therein. And a cure is certain. 
This is a domestic application that every housekeeper can apply promptly. I have questions. I don't know about you, but I have questions about this recipe. Um, 1868, it's referring to something called common soft soap. I do not know what that would be in the late 19th century. Presumably, since it refers to it that way, it was well known. Um, like, I know what soft soap is today, and I don't think it's at all what they would have had as soft soap then. Then they want air slackened lime, and I don't think they mean the fruit. Um, so I, I think they are referring to the mineral lime. <clears throat> Which, okay, so you're taking the soft soap, you're mixing in lime. Then they tell you to mix it until it is the consistency of a glazer's putty. Does everybody know what a glazer's putty consistency is? Like, that seems like a strange common knowledge thing for everybody to know what the consistency of a... a glazier's putty would be. And if you're not familiar with the term glazier, that is somebody who works with glass, uh, specifically would have been um, the profession of somebody who installed windows. Um, so like window putty, essentially. Does everybody even know? Like that seems like a very strange consistency reference to be putting in a general use. Uh, and then you make a leather thimble Fill it with the compound and insert the finger inside of it. So soap and lime. Apparently a paste of soap and lime to cure that felon. Um, yeah, and then we get another ad for the uh, cough syrup. Oh but with more. <clears throat> I have prepared and sold this syrup for more than 15 years. It has given universal satisfaction and whenever it has been tried, the sale of it has become permanent. Its direct influence is on the parts affected, giving almost immediate relief. The syrup immediately relieves the disagreeable sensation of tickling in the throat and difficulty of breathing. It loosens the phlegm, introduces free expectoration, all, uh, allays irritation, prevents inflammation from extending to the substance of the lungs, and sub subdues any tendency of, pardon me, and subdues any tendency of consumption. As it is palatable, the youngest children take it without difficulty. Directions for using the syrup. For adults, the usual dose is from one to two teaspoonfuls. For children from seven to 10 years old, about one teaspoonful. From two to seven years of age, from 30 to 60 drops. And for, inf in for infants from one to two years old, from 10 to 30 drops. The above are only the average doses. which ought to be varied to suit each individual case. Sometimes a less quantity will be sufficient, but very often large doses will be found necessary. If desired, it may be mixed when taken in a small quantity of cold water. Yeah, cough syrup dosage doesn't seem to have changed a whole lot. You're, you are right on the money there, Hannah. Um, And then we have croup. Croup is an acute inflammation of the windpipe and the air passages uh, to the lungs. It is highly dangerous from the false coating it forms on the inner, uh, on the, sorry, it's a little pale. I just can't make it out on the monitor. The monitor is a little too far away. So I'm gonna look down at the table again. Uh, croup is an acute inflammation of the windpipe and the air passages to the lungs. It is highly dangerous from the false coating it forms on the inner surface of these pipes. 
which sometimes entirely stops them and suffocates the patient. Children from 1 to 10 years old are peculiarly subject to it, especially during damp cold seasons and in low marshy places. It, result, it requires immediate treatment. So rapid and fatal is its progress. The symptoms, the symptoms is commonly a peculiar the symptoms is commonly a peculiar ringing cough occurring most likely in the night with a choking or wheezing in the throat and chest and a difficulty of breathing. On the first alarm, give two or three times the usual dose of the cough syrup and repeat it and repeat if necessary. To produce vomiting, if the syrup is given in time, it will remove the disease without vomiting. Okay. Whooping cough. How, however severe the paroxysms may be... Ev the sentence structure in some of these sentences trips me up a little bit. However severe the paroxysms may be alleviated and quite cured by the use of the cough syrup. Given three or four times a day, it allays the irritation from extending to the substance of the lungs. They talk about it as though it is the only cough syrup in existence. Rather than repeatedly calling out their name brand, they just call it the cough syrup, capital C, capital S. In the cough attending bronchitis, use the cough syrup freely. It immediately suppresses the cough and pain, removing the difficulty of breathing by producing a free and easy expectoration. For the cough attending measles, scarlet fever, or smallpox, use the syrup the same as for any other cough. Prepared only by Dr. Samuel J. Sears, Tuthill, Ulcaster County, New York. And then we get into some testimonials. I just want to see if there's anything more beyond the testimonials. Those pages are nice and dark. More and more testimonials. And see these, these. So if you remember last week's episode where we had the um, Camcell Star, Camcell Sar, Comcell Sar, and the author of that item was complaining about how all testimonials are always from all over the place and never from the community that the person lives in. And he could be, you could be sure he was honest because his testimonials were all from Lexington, Kentucky, where he made his product. Well, I've got Ulster County, New York, Ulster County, New York, Orange County, New York. The testimonials here are also local. Not all of them. They have local and distant testimonials. Actually seems more reliable than the other guy who ranted and raved about how testimonials were never local. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to read the testimonials. We, we read, read one earlier. Um, I'll read the last one and then I'll read the closing. Um, Kerhonkson, Ker New York, April 19th, 1869. I have used Dr. S.J. Sears's cough syrup for more than 15 years and have never found an article equal to it and know it to be a sure remedy for those diseases for which it is recommended. I am acquainted with at least a hundred persons who will bear the same testimony. Henry M. German. We could publish thousands of such testimonials as the foregoing, but deem these sufficient to induce those having coughs, colds, or any affection of the lungs to try the syrup feeling confident that if they once use it, they would not under any consideration be without it in the future. Try it. Try it. If you have a cough or cold, call for Dr. S.J. Sears's cough syrup and take no other. 
If your druggist or merchant is out of it, tell him to order it from us or from our agents, H.P. Sears & Company, 238 Greenwich Street, New York City. It can also be bought at wholesale in Kingston, uh, Kingston, Rondot, Ellenville, Honsdale, and all places of note. Dr. S.J. Sears & Son, Proprietors, Tuthill, Ulster County, New York. Flip back one page. Was there something in particular? Or if I need to go back more pages, I don't know when you posted that. So uh, if this isn't the page you were hoping I would turn back to, let me know. Weekly casket. Oh. I will read that one. <laughs> you had a quick eye. I didn't linger on these pages for very long. Pine Bush, New York, March 9, 1808. This is to certify that we have used Dr. S. J. Sears's cough syrup for upwards of 10 years and never in our experience have we ever found an article superior to it or one which we should choose in preference. And as such, we cheerfully recommend it to the public. L. Winfield, editor, Weekly Casket. I'm not sure that's a great testimonial. I mean, it's a great testimonial. I'm not sure that you want the Weekly Casket endorsing your medicine. Library of Congress, The Weekly Casket, New York, New York, 18-something through a date that begins with one. <laughs> Don't know when it was published, apparently. A family paper devoted to the sciences, arts, general intelligence, poetry, etc., etc., published every Monday. Huh. Also called the New York Casket. <laughs> I, d I don't know. The name of two 19th century newspapers, one in New York City and one in Hagerstown, Maryland. Yeah, I, I had just looked key squared at the Library of Congress, uh, the first hit. I didn't look at the second hit. But yeah, Hagerstown, Maryland, um, 1848 through 18 something. It does sound like a trade paper for undertakers. <laughs> okay. That's an interesting receipt book. And just, so the font here at the top, where it says Sears's, just makes me wonder, I don't know the history of Sears, the department store, and whether this has any affiliation. But the font makes me ask that question. I'm guessing probably not, SJ Sears. from Ulster County, New York, probably has nothing to do with Sears as the uh, department store. Just putting this back into the plastic, mylar, or whatever, and back inside its envelope because it is a rather fragile one. <laughs> uh, hello, Scraff. How are you? We are live, yeah. see what else we have. <laughs> Doing good. Um, enjoying exploring uh, some of these items from our special collections. Uh, shouldn't I be wearing gloves? No. Um, <laughs> so I do have gloves. 
uh, I've got the white gloves. Um, on older paper items, especially clean hands are all you really need. Um, and the gloves can actually be bad for the items because as the edges of the paper fray, um, the gloves, uh, so it depends on the item and it depends on where you are. We have cotton gloves here and the cotton gloves can actually catch the frayed edges and tear the paper. So clean hands are actually better for the items. If I had nitrile glove, gloves, um, which are kind of like, um, I mean, they're like a plastic type material. If I had nitrile gloves, um, those possibly would be something we would want to use. And if we had like something super, super old, uh, we may want to do that. Um, but in general, the, the little bit of like oils from your skin that would be present in handling um, the items that I'm working with, uh, as long, like I washed my hands right before I started the show. Um, the reason I have gloves is for if I'm working with like photographs or something, if I show off uh, glossy photos or something like that on stream, um, those, the oils from my hand will damage the items and so then I need to wear the gloves. But uh, for the materials that I'm showing off today, I generally don't need the gloves because the gloves actually could potentially be worse for the item. Yeah, uh, so nitrile uh, gloves would be plastic gloves. Um, and we, we just, we don't have those. Um, the other issue with gloves is that they actually reduce your manual dexterity uh, so when working with old items, your hands actually get more clumsy when you have gloves on, uh, which can be worse for the item. And honestly, anytime you're handling an old item like this, you have the potential to damage it. So it's really weighing whether, uh, weighing which one is going to be better or worse. Um, and the archives here where I work, uh, we generally will just work with clean hands uh, unless we're working with photographs. Uh, yeah, so without the gloves, um, the bare hands gives a better feel for turning the pages and knowing when I'm potentially going to damage it or not. Um, and the plastic ones would, yeah, was not worth it. The, the plastic ones would also reduce your manual dexterity. Um, we don't have anything like super, super old, like uh, say papyrus items or um, like, I think the oldest items that we have are from the 1400s. Um, and I have not pulled those out to handle them recently. Uh, but if we had like really old items that needed special, like really special uh, care and handling, um, there are other methods for working with those. A lot of times you won't touch them at all with your hands. You'll end up using um, needle nose like tweezers to lift and turn pages and you do so very delicately and those are, we don't have anything quite like that here. <laughs> so, um, you're a graphics designer, cool. You try to recreate old logos and labels, that's cool. Uh, something from the 1920s. Um, I don't know exactly what I have on the cart, but I can try. Um, and I don't know what date this is from because it doesn't say on the catalog card but let me let me look <laughs> 1692 that's not the 1920s <laughs> 1734, 1886, 1891, 1919. 
that's right around that time. Uh, I also have... I don't remember when these were from. Let me look and see. I'm not certain. I don't see a date on them, but these could be around then. You're curious about the 17th century one, Keysword? I will show that in just a moment. Um, I'm going to check the date on uh, the Pinkham pamphlets real quick. So one second. Uh, many tools here. Uh, and it's possible that I just don't have a date on this, um, but the art on it seems 20s to me. Come on. Here we go. So everything in this collection is from... One second. <laughs> I have to get to the right spot here. Uh, 1870s to 1990s. And these are from... Pinkham. Uh, yeah, 1930s. Well, let's look at the uh, food and health that I have on the camera first. I have a 1919 item. I have some 1930s items. I can, I can look on the cart and see if I can find something from the 20s. Um, and I will look at the 17th century item for you, what not, was not worth it, um, or key squared. Um, but food and health, which I don't have a date on, uh, 1930s is fine too. Great. I do have, um, uh, some, yeah, I have a whole folder of stuff from the thirties. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you found it, Scraff. Uh, we're here, um, every Wednesday, although we won't be here next week. Uh, but generally Wednesdays, uh, 2.30 to 4.30 PM Eastern time. Um, and I sh share various different things from um, our collections uh, at Virginia Tech. And um, so this is the last week that we're doing um, the folk medicine stuff. Uh, the next time that we're live on the 8th of September, we'll be doing um, early computer technical manuals. And then I'm not sure what we're doing the week after that. I still have to decide. Um, Let me read back the comments here real quick. One would have a label designed for a company in the 19th century. I'm not certain, Scraff. I, I'm really not um, an expert in like old advertisements, so I'm not sure um, how somebody would have done that. I do know that we have... Um, I definitely was going through a few streams ago, went through some materials where it was very clear that uh, somebody had just had their company information added onto uh, like a mass produced item because we had the same advertisement for two different companies that were not even in the same state. So they were both, um, uh, we were looking at food pamphlets and it was the same art on one side and then on the back was different company information. And that was from sometime in the 1800s. Um, so uh, I'm guessing advertising firms uh, existed that would help you and could offer you like a, a selection of 
ads. I'm just not 100% sure um, because uh, that's kind of not my area of expertise. <laughs> Oh, no, Scruff, uh, questions are totally fine. This is meant to be educational. Um, I just, a lot of it is the materials themselves and what we learn from them and from the people in chat who are knowledgeable in areas. Um, my expertise uh, is more focused on um, things relating to theater or community formation, uh, community structure, things like that. I find old ads really fascinating. I just don't know a whole lot about them. Hannah, your phone just gave you the notification that I'm live. Uh, wow. <laughs> that took a little while to get there, huh? All right. Oh, geez. So we open first off the very first thing in here. Do women read? It, it continues, but the headline is, Do women read our little books, which come so regularly to their homes? Indeed they do, and if only one is left at a two-family house, we are asked to send another at once. We feel sure that they read from cover to cover. And hey, look at that. Lydia E. Pinkham's Medicines, which is the folder of 1930s stuff that we'll look at in a few minutes, uh, which we looked at three weeks ago, I think. Um, Lydia E. Pinkham's Vegetable Compound, the original Pinkham medicine and best known of all. It has been on the market for nearly 50 years and is put up in the following forms. Liquid, uh, dose, one tablespoonful every four hours through, through the day, dry tablets, Dose one tablet every four hours through the day. Lydia E. Pinkham's Sanative Wash uh, for leucorrhea and inflammation. Liquid, a concentrated extract, ready to dilute and use at once. The most convenient form. Use daily as a vaginal injection. Uh, add one tea teaspoonful, in severe cases two teaspoonfuls, of the sanative wash to one pint of warm water, mix thoroughly, and it is ready for use. Can be had, if preferred, in dry form to steep. Uh, blood medicine and liver pills. For sale by druggists, generally. <laughs> I think this is an entire... I think this is just another Pinkham pamphlet. Uh, that just is not part of the collection of Pinkham pamphlets, but this is just another Pinkham pamphlet like the others, only I don't know what year this one is from. It might also be from the 1930s. But each page is giving us cleaning tips or a recipe, because uh, this is food and health for this pamphlet. Um, casserole of rice and meat. <laughs> we get a recipe. And then helpful hints. To keep the daily paper from blowing away when it is left on the porch, get the carrier to snap it into a spring, clo into a spring clothespin, which is tied to the railing. When a woman knows that a certain medicine is good, she wants no substitute or makeshift. The women who take Lydia E. Pinkham's vegetable compound are of this class. They know what they want, and they will take nothing less. Um, let me see. Well, we're going to be looking at more Pinkham's stuff in a minute, just uh, partly for the art. I'm going to move off of this one. We'll look at the um, 19... 19 item, then we'll look at the 1600s item, and then we'll do the um, the other Pinkham pamphlets. Um, 1919, so right around 1920. What does one who works in archives actually do other than maintain them? So most of the, uh, most archives work is um, organizing and describing materials. So a lot of what I'm sharing on here are from our rare books collection. Um, but if we get in 
manuscripts. Uh, so like somebody's collection of personal papers or records from a business or something like that. Um, we get them and they're in like file cabinet folders and they may have some organization to them, they may not. Uh, and so a lot of archives work is you get, you might get a folder or you might get 80 boxes of papers um, or you might get three hard drives worth of material and kind of sorting through it, getting a sense for what's there um, and describing what is there so that people can find it. Uh, so we write what are called finding aids that tell people what the contents of a collection are. Um, and then if a researcher comes in and they're searching for a specific topic or something like that, um, we can help them to look through our finding aids, figure out which materials might have relevant information, uh, and help them to gain access to those materials so that they can do the research that they're doing. Um, so generally, in a short description, that's kind of, that's kind of what archives do. Um, this show that I do here is about uh, raising awareness of what we have in our collections and kind of helping to promote the use of them. Also, it's just really cool and fun. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, archives work is about describing and organizing um, in the materials so that people can use them for research. Uh, so we have a, a pamphlet here called The Care of the Baby. This is from 1919. Um, so this would still be before, before like the flapper movement, before um, kind of that 1920s jazz era. Uh, the Happy Way to Health. Born Shelbyville, Missouri, March 27, 1839. Graduated Rush Medical College, Chicago, Illinois, 1875. Practiced medicine, uh, Piot County, Illinois, since 1875. At the age of 80, still practicing his profession and is loved and honored by all in the community where he has lived and labored for so many years. The picture which appears on the package as a part of the trademark of Dr. Caldwell's Syrup Pepsin, was taken in 1892 and is reproduced here so that readers of this booklet may familiarize themselves with it, and when calling for Syrup Pepsin, be assured of securing the genuine. Dr. W. B. Caldwell today, Dr. Caldwell in 1892. I hereby certify that the formula which is now and has since 1892 been in use in the manufacture of Dr. Caldwell's syrup pepsin is the same formula that I originated and used so successfully in my practice. W.B. Caldwell, MD. It is, um, it is really fascinating, Scraff. Um, a lot of collections I would love to get more time to work with, like I go through I get a sense of what's there. I write the description. I don't get to dig in and actually like use the materials. Um, it kind of in the same way that a historian might or that a researcher might. Um, but there are some really fascinating things. And like uh, two weeks from now, when I'm going to be uh, showing off the Gerhard, Gerhard Mansbach collection of technical manuals, um, which are like early, early computer technical manuals. Um, I find it to be a really fascinating collection. I've barely looked at it. I only looked at it to see if we wanted to accept it as part of our collections. It hasn't even been processed yet. Processing would be our, our means of going through and describing what's there. That hasn't been done with it yet. Um, and so I'm excited because by doing this show, I actually get to look at the materials and kind of dig deeper into them than we normally get to do in the archives. Um, let's see, baby's basket, baby's bath. Unless there is some special reason to the contrary, a child should be bathed daily up to the time it is three years old. If for any reason the tub bath is not advisable, a sponge bath using the soft washcloth instead of a sponge should be given. Cleanliness inside and out is the great essential to health and comfort. 
A child should be bathed regularly and its clothing changed frequently. The tub or basin used for baby's bath should never be used for any other purpose and should be kept scrupulously clean. Give the bath quick Give the bath quickly in warm, not hot, water and keep the temperature of the room in which the bath is given at from 70 to 75 degrees. If possible, the bath should be given before an open fire. For the first few weeks, the bath should be given at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. As the baby grows older, the temperature of the water is gradually reduced. When all is ready, first wash the face with clear water, then soap the scalp and rinse thoroughly, being careful not to let the soap get into the eyes. Dry gently, but thoroughly, especially back of the ears, never rub the skin. Use the towel more as you would a piece of, of blotting uh, paper. Next, soap the entire body. Place baby in the tub or basin and bathe, rinsing the soap out of every fold and crease of the skin. Now wrap the child in a soft, warm towel and dry gently but thoroughly. Sprinkle the body lightly with talcum and dress. After baby is dressed, take a piece of absorbent cotton, saturate it with the uh, boracic solution. I don't know what that is. Um, and wash one eye. Then with another piece of cotton, repeat the operation for the other eye. Never use the same piece of cotton for more than one operation. So that, that should be part, wait, so that should one part be infected in any way, the infection will not be conveyed to another part. Cleanse the nostrils in similar manner, using a separate piece of cotton for each nostril. Roll the bit of cotton to a point, saturate it with the solution, and twist it around once or twice in the nostril. Now your little darling is ready for sleep. Wrap it up snugly in its crib and leave it. I mean, this is seems like a, a manual for new mothers. Um, and honestly, that's... Very detailed information. I don't know what a boracic uh, solution is. B-O-R-A-C-I-C. -C. Ah, so it's another term for boric. So this would be like boric acid solution. So just like a mild acidic disinfectant what to do when baby cries, drink of water, baby ailments. Interesting. Of course, it's the Pepsin Syrup Company. I'm sure that they advertise their products heavily in there. Uh, that one's less interesting than some of the others, but honestly, the seems like a really useful pamphlet for like new parents. Um, <laughs> yes, I love old advertisements. I think they're really, really neat. Um, they, they definitely have a sense of style. And you can see the change in that, in kind of what the style is from an ad in the 1880s and 1890s, they'll kind of be similar, but when you get to around 1900, there's a distinctive look, like the, the look of the ads changes from the 1800s to the 1900s. And then from uh, the 1900s to the 1910s, it's kind of subtle, but you can tell the difference between the two. And then you get into the 20s and you get the flapper and the jazz era and the ads change again. And then the 1930s, they, they evolve a little bit more. And so kind of each decade, you can kind of see an evolution or a complete change in the visual um, style of the advertisements. It's, and same, um, honestly, up through like the 1980s and 90s even, um, and I think if I paid more attention to like modern advertising, the visual style I'm sure is distinct today than it would have been in like the 20 zeros, the like uh, 2000 through 2010. Um, Cause if you look at like TV ads or print ads in magazines from the nineties, they're very different from the eighties and from the seventies and the sixties. Um, but when you hit around 19, the 1960s, they start to have um, 
photographs instead of illustrations. Um, and so the artistic style is more a photo photographic style than an illustrative style. <laughs> I know a little bit about them. I'm not an expert by any, any sense of the mean or, or of the word. So here we have an item. This is from 1692 called a pocket companion. To my eye, this appears to have been rebound at some point. Um, I do not believe that this is the original cover for this item. Um, notable things of consumptions. Consumptions are decays of the radical moisture whereby the natural heat of the stomach is so weakened that it cannot make a due separation of meats and drinks received, which causes from thence uh, to... From thence to arise. Wow, I don't know why that one was so hard for me to make out. Uh, causes from thence to arise abundance of bad juices or phlegm, so that no good nourishment can be bred. Let the food be never so rich, nor the drink cordial, which all people afflicted find by experience. But these distempers proceed likewise from various, er, for, from various causes as 1. From overcharging nature with too great quantities of rich food, or in others by drinking much brandy, wine, and strong drinks, which weakens the natural heat and destroys the action of the stomach. So the font here is really difficult surprisingly difficult. Like, I know what these letters are. I'm going to zoom in a little bit just to show off the font a little bit. Um, like I said, this is from 1692 is when this was printed. And as you can see, um, in most cases, in the middle of a word, the S is that little, um, I don't remember the name of the actual letter form, uh, but here in consumptions, it looks sort of like an F without the line through it. Um, and that is an S. Uh, but then at the end of words, you have the S that we use today. Um, but then there are other places. So like afflicted, anywhere there's a C and a T together, they're joined at the top. Um, so just the font makes this one a little bit difficult to, to read. Um, and I know there's a specific term for that F, uh, that F letter form that is an S. I just don't remember the name of it. <laughs> um, the key squared, are you referring to the connection of the C and the T together, uh, asking if that is a ligature? I'm not, I'm not certain. Um, I don't spend a lot of time with this age of document. Um, the things that I'm more an expert in are from the, generally from like, the 1960s onward. <laughs> so this is a few hundred years before where I'm really immersed in the material. Um, so I'm, I'm not certain if the, the joined letter form is called a ligature or not. It sounds like it probably would be. Um, uh, so the newest uh, scrap, the newest documents that we have are from a couple months ago. Um, and then the oldest that we have, I believe we have something in our rare books collection from the 1400s, but I don't, I, I can't say 100% 1400s. I know we have multiple things from the 1600s um, and definitely have some things from the 1500s. I want to say 1400s is the oldest that we have in our archives. I just don't remember 100%. Uh, 
Yeah, the cover, this has definitely been rebound. And I do not know why they have full stops at the end of titles on here. <laughs> that is a good question. Um, let me see. Milk. Gruel. Flummery. The pages here definitely feel old. The cover feels really new. A number of things here about flummery, sugars, oil. Of the occasion of colds and coughs and their cure. Coughs and colds are produced by intemperance in meats, drinks, exercises and habits, or by eating or drinking too much in quantity and things of contrary quality or improperly prepared and not from thin clothing as many imagine. For if the inside be found, or if, if the inside be sound and clean, there is little danger of outward inconveniences. The best way to prevent outward colds and the evils that happen through thick and thin clothing uh, and by heats, sweatings, and the like, is to change your clothes often. Uh, as, for example, put on when you stay at home in the morning one, f one sort of clothes, and when you go out, put off your clothes to your shirt, and put on fresh and cold clothes, and again at night, pull off these to the shirt and put on the others. And for those that sweat much by their labor, let them pull off all their clothes, shirt and all, and put on fresh, fresh shirts and cold clothing. Uh, and for those that over, overly travel themselves, let them do the like, but observe that both sit still a while before they either eat or drink. Observe far, or farther by the by that prunes, figs, and nuts, and almonds, and many other such like things ought not to be eaten at all, except only with common bread or with a physical way, or in a physical way in opening, in opening drinks. Also candied gingers, all sorts of uh, conserves and preserves and all confections, hodgepodge cakes, buns are very prejudicial for and obstructing and, uh, and obstruct the passages, generate crudities, spoil the stomach and prepare matter for a multitude of diseases. So yeah, don't eat those prunes, figs and nuts and almonds or candied gingers and confections and preserves. Apparently those will make you sick and you should definitely be changing your clothes quite often. Stripping down to your shirt, which would be an undershirt, uh, and changing everything on top to cold clothes because you don't wanna overheat those clothes because then you're gonna get sick. Seems to make sense, sort of. I don't think, I mean, this was 1692. They didn't really know where most sicknesses came from by then, so. Very helpful advice. I'm sure that the local tailor really appreciated that advice. How a man may live for two pence or three pence a day very well. A man in the country may live plentifully for two pence a day, for in many countries you may have two quarts of milk for a penny, to which add a pint of water, and not half a penny worth of flour, and make it into floured milk according to our directions, and you will have a noble dish, sufficient for four people, and this stands but in three and a half pence, uh, eat some bread with it and there is no victuals affords better nourishment and that to all ages but especially young people 
the like is to be understood of foods where everyone observes his time of eating and his weight and measure of food, and a great trouble and uh, waste will thereby be avoided. As to quantity of other foods, we suppose that 16 ounces solid food to wit bread, cheese, butter, and eggs may be sufficient 24 hours for a laboring man, and the best time for eating we suppose to be about 8 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon. If the food be floured milk, then a pint of it and four ounces of bread and butter or cheese is sufficient. If water gruel or pottage, a pint and four ounces of bread and cheese. If raw milk, the same. But if floured milk with an egg in it, three ounces of bread and butter or, cheese, or of cheese will be sufficient. If you eat raw salad, weigh only your bread and about five ounces will be sufficient. With an ounce of cheese or butter to eat after your herbs, as for puddings, apple pies, and the like, I leave to everyone's discretion, but you must be sparing and temperate. As for drink water, or as for drink, water has the first place, and a quart of water mixed with two spoonfuls of ground oatmeal and well brewed together, ten or twelve times out of one porringer into another make an excellent drink, and in summertime tis very pleasant. In wintertime, if you make it blood warm, it will drink well. Milk and water is an excellent drink. Thus, you see a small matter sufficeth to a moderate man. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, we have thousands of items in the archives. Uh, tens of thousands. So, um, I don't have my computer here, I, like the actual statistics of, of like the oldest item and um, how many things we have in, in the archives in each of our collections. I have that information and I use it when I do um, guest lectures for classes. Um, I just don't have the computer that has those presentations on it here. Oh, but actually I may be able to look real quick. Uh, and then we'll take a look at our lovely 1930s pamphlets here. Um, let me look. I just need to open. Instruction folder. This one maybe? Uh, yeah, not that one. This one should have it. Look at me remembering where I saved things. Uh, okay. So, our unpublished primary sources, which, so that would be letters, diaries, family papers, scrapbooks, etc. Um, we have over 1,900 collections um, with more than 18,000 cubic feet of material. Uh, so I don't know actual like numbers of how many items, but we have over 18,000 cubic feet um, of material. Uh, and then that doesn't include any of the like, newspapers, um, blog posts, radio shows, TV shows, podcasts, social media updates, YouTube, uh, uh, rare books, etc. So we have all of those types of things as well. Um, let's see, rare books. We have over 45,000 items on site and over 30,000 in offsite storage. Um, with uh, more than 8,000 on the American Civil War, more than 4,500 on the history of food and drink, more than 6,500 um, that are Virginia Tech publications because Part of our rare books collection includes publications from the university here. Um, and we have materials from the 15th century onwards. The earliest item that we have uh, was printed in Venice in the early 1480s, uh, which was 30 years after the introduction of movable type to Europe. Um, so, yeah. And then uh, we have over 50,000 
photographs in the collection, mo more than 1,500 maps. Um, so we, we have quite a lot of things. <laughs> um, the stretching your dollar, so these pamphlets here, um, I'm just gonna, I'll put out a couple of them so you can see. Um, these are from the, our culinary pamphlet collection. It's the only folder that I have here from the collection because this one is from a medicine company, the Lydia E. Pinkham Medicine Company, that this company was particularly focused on um, what we would call today women's health. Uh, they produced products to help with women's menstruation cycle. Um, so, but the pamphlets themselves are focused on uh, kind of household care, household duties. So stretching your dollar would be about budgeting for cleaning supplies and food and stuff like that. Favorite recipes has recipes. Um, then we have uh, practical cooking recipes. We have hints for food and health. Um, we have sweets. We have fruits and candies. Come into the kitchen. How to be happy. Let's make a garden. Um, picnic time. And the one that was really, really interesting the last time we pulled these out, our wild neighbors. Um, and so all of these were meant for kind of the woman of the house uh, gave advice. So like, let's make a garden, tells you how to make a garden. But in all of them, I'm just gonna get this so that I can show the inside of one or two of them. Um, in addition to being on a specific topic. So like this one is sweets. This one is gonna give you recipes for making sweets. Um, in addition to that though, they all have advertisements for Lydia E. Pinkham's medicines uh, because these were produced by the medicine company and their target audience was women. So they produced articles that give instruction in household management and recipes for use. It's basically a, a, a magazine telling them how to be a good housewife and also at the same time advertising a product to them that would be useful for their health. Um, so it's an early form of targeted marketing here. Uh, So we get after dinner mints, chocolate macaroons, but then at the bottom, so the, and candied orange peel. So the top half of the page is dedicated to recipes on the topic. At the bottom though, we have maturity. The periods of menstruation begin between the ages of 11 and 15 years and continue until about the age of 45 at regular intervals of from 24 to 28 days. And in all cases where there is reason to fear that anything is wrong with regard to this process of menstruation, no precaution is more valuable than the prompt use of Lydia E. Pinkham's vegetable compound. My daughter suffered with irregular menstruation so that she was not able to go to school at times. I had used Lydia E. Pinkham's vegetable compound, so I gave it to her with good results. She is now working in a basket factory. I recommend your medicine to my friends, and you may publish these facts. Mrs. G. M. Crandall, Converse, Indiana. Um, and there's illustration throughout. Uh, so it's the juxtaposition of the um, useful information with the testimonials and advertising for the product that the company that made the pamphlet wants to sell. Um, oh boy. But here we get some, some of that questionable medicine that, uh, that we expect from older things. So this would fall into the patent medicine category. Uh, nervous disorders. Disorders of the female organs affect the nerves, 
causing despondency, fretting, and worrying, impatience and restlessness, and excitability, which are demonstrably not true facts. It was believed uh, for a long time, uh, but no. Uh, we know today that that is not indeed the case. <laughs> Lovely confectionery recipe, and then some more intimate problems. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> we get cream fruit fudge, followed by flooding, which is excessive or profuse menstruation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, taffy, followed by nervous disorders. <laughs> So, and, and this, this being the, um, the Sweets magazine is a particularly odd juxtaposition, a particularly distressing one, uh, where it's like, oh my, um, whereas if I go and pull out the, uh, oh, I'll show you the back of that one too. If you look at the front of it and the back of it, you look at the covers and you're like, oh, this is going to be all about desserts. Great. And then inside, it is about desserts and more. <laughs> but this one, the Our Wild Neighbors one, um, I find fascinating. So this one... Um, Still giving you the advertisements, so all of this one, in, indeed the Liddy E. Pinkham's product is displayed with, uh, so Pinkham's as a product had been around for quite a while at this point, I want to say 60 or 70 years. We looked it up a few weeks ago and I believe it was sometime in the 1800s when it first uh, was created, um, and these ads are from the 30s, um, but they've got, you know, that kind of eight, 1800s woman on the package. Um, but so this book is all about, it, it talks about different animals and puts them in juxtaposition to ads for these feminine products, uh, or f what would have been feminine products then, um, uh, ads for these products dealing with reproductive health for people with uteruses. Um, and re looking at this one, I was trying to figure out, like, why? Like, the recipes made sense. The cleaning, how to clean the house made sense. The only thing I can think of for why they put out a book about animals was for mothers who have sons. In the 1930s, this would not have been content for a daughter. Um, but knowing about wildlife, knowing about animals, knowing about lions and the American eagle and uh, porcupines and um, camels would have been stuff that a mother could use to relate to a young boy. Uh, so that is my guess as to why this pamphlet was created, to give some basic knowledge to a housewife about topics that were typically outside of a girl's or women's uh, realm of knowledge for the time uh, that she could then use to relate to a son which I just find really fascinating because it's like, oh, as a little girl, you don't need to know this. But when you're an adult with a boy as a child, you need to know this. <laughs> so providing that information to you alongside advertisements for uh, products to maintain your uterus and vagina. <laughs> um, and, and so the juxtaposition here is somewhat different than for, than in the other book where the top half of each page was a recipe and the bottom half was not. 
Um, here we get every other page. So this page is an ad, this page is information. Um, which honestly I think is less obtrusive. It, it doesn't, it's not as jarring a juxtaposition when it's on a different page. I don't know. Wait, apparently childishness was considered a problem? Where, where did you see that, Hannah? Which page was that on? Because I will read that. Oh, the, the other book? I'm trying to keep up with chat and look at the items and let me look at the other book. Because now I'm curious about childishness, childishness being a problem. Or was that the maturity stuff? Fault pressed near the end flooding nervous disorders backache women's operations childishness not childishness being childless childlessness yes childlessness i thought and I even look wow in in chat i read it as childishness and in the book, I read it as childishness, and it's childlessness. <laughs> a large number of women are incapable of childbearing because of some disturbance or impediment in the functions of the generative organs. The success attending the use of Lydia E. Pinkham's vegetable compound indicates that the cause of sterility may be removed and the maternal instinct gratified. I had one child but wanted another and could not have more, although I seemed well and healthy. A friend who had been in the same condition took your medicine and had three children. So I took Lydia E. Pinkham's vegetable compound. It has helped me too and I have a fine 10 pound boy. I recommend your medicine and you may use this letter if it will help others. Mrs. H.M. Coleman from Omaha, Nebraska. So these are the type of uh, claims. These are the type of claims that um, patent medicines often made. Like, just use our compound and you can, you can cure yourself of being unable to bear children. From a compound made from a bunch of vegetables pressed together. <laughs> um, but yeah, the illustrations here They're, they're really nice. I love the ads. Um, let's see. I'm going to do... We've got six minutes. Let me see if I've got something interesting to show in the six minutes we have left. Uh, what's this? Maybe. Maybe not. Care of the baby, food and health, almanac, household guide. Oh, I should show this one. Just because I pulled it, it's not going to be super visual. Um, and we're not going to have a lot of time to read things from it, and I'm rolling over my cord again. Um, this is The Complete Housewife. Uh, this is an item from our History of Food and Drink collection. Uh, we have a couple of different versions of a book called The Complete Housewife. This one is 1734. Um, and so this is a manual for how to run a house. And in 1734, running a house was a lot more like what you see on the show Downton Abbey than running a modern house. Uh, so this is 
<clears throat> intended as a, a guide for the woman of the house. Uh, I think it's not quite... The Complete Housewife or Accomplished Gentlewoman's Companion, being a collection of upwards of 500 of the most approved rest receipts in cookery, pastry, confectionery, preserving, pickles, cakes, creams, jellies, made wines, cordials, uh, with copper plate, uh, copper plates curiously engraven for the regular disposition or placing of various dishes and courses, and also bills of fare for every month in the year, uh, to which is added a collection of above 200 family receipts of medicines, viz. drinks, syrups, salves, ointments, and various other things of sovereign and approved efficacy and most distempers, pains, aches, wounds, sores, and never before made public fit either for private families or such public spirited gentlewomen as would be beneficent to the poor to their poor neighbors that was the complete title everything from the complete to neighbors is the title of this book by e smith sixth edition with very large editions, nearly 50 receipts being communicated just before the author's death. London, printed for J. Pemberton at the Golden Buck, over against St. Dunstan's Church in Fleet Street, 1734, price five shillings. <laughs> um, I actually love the printing in this. I love the font. I, it's just great. Preface. It being grown as un, uh, it being grown as unfashionable for a book now to appear in public without a preface, as for a lady to appear at a ball without a hoop petticoat, I shall conform to custom for fashion's state sake and not through any necessity. The subject, being both common and universal, needs no arguments to introduce it, and being so necessary for the gratification uh, of the appetite, stands in need of no economi e economums. Wow, that's hard to say. Economums. Econ en encomiums. No encomiums to allure persons to the practice of it since there are but few nowadays who love not good eating and drinking. Therefore, I entirely quit those two topics, but having three or four pages to be filled up previous to the subject itself, I shall employ them on a subject I think new and not yet handled by any of the pretenders to the art of cookery, and that is the antiquity of it, which if it either instruct or divert, I shall be satisfied if you are so. Anyway, there's a lengthy preface, there's a lengthy title, there's a lot of recipes. Um, this is in remarkably good condition. Um, I don't know. Aha! In the back here we have how, uh, uh, an entire section on how to lay out your table. So this is for the second course, the dessert in the middle, wild ducks, rabbits, uh, sweet meats, macaroons, almond flummery. So again, lots of recipes. If, if I dig through this book, we would find um, home remedies or like medicines. I do think this one appears also to have been rebound uh, I don't believe this is the original cover on this one either. Uh, yes, Fleet Street, the home of Sweeney Todd. Um, do I have anything on handwriting? Um, I'm not sure. It's possible. I would have to. I would have to do a search of our archives to find out. Um, uh, it's not a particular focus of our collections, we collect in certain areas. Um, Spencerian handwriting.
Uh, so actual, like, we would have items in Spencerian script. I don't think we would have any resources on it as a topic. So um, I, we definitely have items that are written with that style of script. Uh, and so it would be a matter of identifying by looking at time period um, and what type of materials they are. Uh, but we would be able to find items that are written in that script. Um, but as a topic of like, if you wanted to learn about Spencerian script, we wouldn't have that because it's not kind of an area that we collect in. Yeah, we have lots of manuscripts. Um, so a, a lot of our collections are manuscript collections. Uh, it's just that for this, I ended up pulling a bunch of stuff that was rare books in, rather than manuscript stuff. Um, but yeah, we we do have a lot of manuscripts. We have a lot of like Civil War era ma manuscripts, like American Civil War stuff, because um, that's one of the collecting areas that we collect. Um, also stuff from uh, families that were local to the Blacksburg area. So we have lots of like letters written, um, some diaries and things like that, um, that relate to local and regional history in this area. Current shift. Um, that one I don't know. Um, can you... That one I would have to search. I don't know if we have anything, um, using current shift. I can... Uh, so I'm not streaming next week. Um, we are at the end of our time right now. Um, but I, and I won't be live next week. Um, the next stream that I'm doing on September 8th is, um, the computer technical manuals, but, um, I don't have anything planned for the week after that. I can pull, um, I can look and see what how many different kinds of script that I can find in our handwritten documents, and we can kind of explore that for um, the week after, which I guess would be, uh, would that be like the 13th? I don't do dates very well. Um, <laughs> one second, I need a calendar to be able to tell that. Uh, 15th, September 15th, um, I will pull um, as many different kinds of handwritten script as I can find in our collection and we'll take a look at those on September 15th. So um, if you wanna come back Wednesday, September 15th at 2.30 p.m., um, I will have those materials and we can, we can explore that as a topic. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, set up a raid. Um, Fluidan, thank you. And uh, thanks everybody for coming by. Um, it's been a good stream today. Um, and as I said, I won't be live next week, but I will be back on the 8th um, for, uh, for some early computer technical manuals. I'm gonna set up the raid. We are gonna be raiding uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, which is who we usually go to. Uh, if I can type it in here. They currently have the shark cam going. So um, thank you. And uh, I hope to see you all again in two weeks time. Um, it is always lovely getting to explore what we have in the archives with all of you here live on Twitch and get to have your questions and your insights into the materials that I share. Um, I really, really enjoy this and I think that it is a worthwhile uh, educational experience. So thank you all for coming and I will see you all next time. Uh, Scraff, it was great having you come and join us for the first time um, and all of the regulars over on the Rogan27 channel. It's uh, great to also have you back. Whether you were chatting or lurking, um, I really do appreciate it. Uh, I will see you all next time. <laughs>